Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to Mike Spark and Woe77. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. Well, it's been a while since the last time we delved into the fiction of Phoenix Point, but with the game just five weeks from launch, I thought we'd play a little catch-up. Namely, today I thought we'd round out our analysis of briefing number five by taking a closer look at the final story, Imperfect Physiology, by Alan Stroud. It's the seventh and second-to-last story in briefing number five, acting as an indirect follow-up to The Good Life, another story by Alan Stroud. It's significantly shorter than The Good Life, and seemingly a lot more straightforward, but like most of Dr. Stroud's stories, there are a lot of interesting little details hidden in the narrative. Now, first of all, let's start by running through a brief synopsis, just so we know what the overall story is about. After that, we'll dig a little deeper, dissecting the references and plot points, and speculating about what it all might mean. Imperfect Physiology focuses on a character named Dr. Lionel Cole, one of the many scientists living in Sinedrion Haven 43. He's romantically entangled with another scientist named Dr. Selena Harris, and the story begins with the two of them having just spent some, uh, quality time together. The two soon part company, returning to their various responsibilities around the Haven. Dr. Cole has been elected to serve as the community representative for the day, and he's scheduled to meet with Lieutenant Jonathan Rivers, an emissary from New Jericho. Apparently, the much more militant faction is hoping to trade 400 gallons of refined petroleum for genetically modified crops that can resist infection by the Pandora virus. The negotiations, or lack thereof, are tense and relatively one-sided, it quickly becomes evident that Sinedrion doesn't actually care about the petroleum, but are instead simply going through the motions so they can effectively use New Jericho as guinea pigs for their own biochemical experiments. We'll come back to that a little later. In the end, the trade is approved, with New Jericho getting updated DNA modifications for their crops, and Sinedrion getting both the fuel and some precious new data. Not only are they provided with updated information about how the Pandora virus is adapting, but they also learn about Project Vulture, New Jericho's own attempt to better understand the Pandora virus. Afterwards, Dr. Cole attends Haven 43's weekly forum, where he was scheduled to make a presentation. This gives us a rare glimpse at how Sinedrion operates, with all major debates and decisions taking place in an open, democratic forum. It also briefly revisits Sanedrion's stated goal to find a biochemical solution to the Pandora virus problem, one which, ideally, would allow them to coexist with the alien invader rather than outright fighting against it. Throughout the course of this forum, Dr. Cole shares the data he acquired during his negotiations with Lieutenant Rivers. During this exchange, he clearly demonstrated that he, at least, held New Jericho in contempt, seeing them as just another resource that Sinedrion should take full advantage of. Again, we'll revisit that a little later. Eventually, Dr. Cole presented his own proposal, an ambitious project that he called the Janus Plan. In a nutshell, he basically suggested that their current attempts to find a biochemical solution were doomed to failure. He instead proposed that they should shift their efforts towards simply preserving humanity instead, rather than trying to find a way to coexist alongside the virus. He essentially suggested digital migration as a means of outliving the threat posed by the Pandora virus. By creating copies of their minds, humanity could be preserved, albeit in digital format, they could then store those copies in a virtual habitat, where they could continue to monitor the outside world while searching for additional solutions. Eventually, they could turn their efforts towards creating new bodies to transfer their minds back into, 
effectively resurrecting the human species once the crisis had passed. He openly admitted that this plan was broad in scope, but short on specific details. For example, he acknowledged that Synedrion didn't currently have the resources needed to actually handle the digital migration. It would essentially require giving up all of their current work in favor of shifting those resources towards his own new project. He also acknowledged the likely psychological issues, noting that converting human minds into a digital format was likely to come with any number of unforeseen difficulties. He hoped that this was a hurdle that Sinedrion's artificial intelligences could help them clear. Still, even then, he acknowledged that they, the actual inhabitants of Haven 43 and Sinedrion as a whole, would still end up dead. Only their memories would live on, along with the hope that humanity could someday be reborn. Unsurprisingly, this presentation did not go over well with his peers and it was unanimously rejected by the inhabitants of Haven 43. Even his lover, Dr. Harris, rejected his proposal, prompting a debate over whether it was better to fight for survival as they are, or to fight for the preservation of the species by any means possible. Their debate was interrupted by the sudden appearance of Adrestia, the second generation AI that was first introduced back in The Good Life. She revealed that while she was feigning absence at the weekly forum, she actually joined the rest of the Haven in rejecting Dr. Cole's proposal for the good of their community. However, while she didn't agree with his proposal as he presented it, she did believe that there were merits to some of his suggestions. The story concludes with Adrestia, Lionel Cole, and Selena Harris agreeing to further discuss a revised version of the Janus plan. So, now that we know what the story is about, let's dig back through it and discuss some of the finer details. We'll start with some of the smaller stuff and work our way up to some of the bigger revelations. First of all, the story takes place in Haven 43, though it's never made clear if this is the Haven's actual name. Although not outright stated, it's heavily implied that this particular haven is not one of the havens featured in any of the other stories. Although Haven 43 might seem like an odd name, it's important to remember that, just like everything else, Sinedrion names its havens based on the results of democratic votes. Similarly, while every member of Sinedrion is allowed time and resources for their own personal projects and pursuits, they also have community-assigned responsibilities, presumably to help the Haven function as a whole. Dr. Cole, for example, is selected to serve as the Haven's representative for the day, while another man named Alistair is instead assigned as the administrator who oversees that week's forum. In both cases, these are implied to be strictly temporary duties, with these particular jobs being rotated amongst the population on a regular basis. While we don't get much in the way of details, the story does briefly touch on some of Haven 43's security features. For example, when Dr. Cole goes to meet with Lieutenant Rivers, he does so in a pressure-locked entrance chamber while wearing a full-body contamination suit with an external oxygen supply. When exchanging information with the lieutenant, he does so using a specially prepared electronic tablet, which is deliberately isolated from the rest of Sinedrion's computer network. He also claims that the lieutenant's Gauss weaponry is useless inside of the chamber, but to be honest, that could just be a bluff on his part. Dr. Cole also specifically mentions that Haven 43 features multiple arboretums, which certainly makes sense given the nature of Sinedrion's work. Given some of the concept art, it's probably safe to assume that most Sinedrion havens will feature similar facilities. This is where they seek to preserve as much of Earth's ecosystem as possible, away from the ravages of the Pandora virus. One slightly unusual detail is that Dr. Cole specifically refers to them as a contemporary version of Utnapishtim's Ark, rather than the more conventional Noah. 
This is quite interesting, considering that Utnapishtim was the central figure in the Babylonian flood myth, a myth which not only is thought to have inspired the story of Noah's Ark, but which also features heavily in the central story of Phoenix Point. It's worth noting that Utnapishtim was specifically mentioned by name in one of Alan Stroud's other stories, The Deaths of Civilization No. 1, where it was at least implied that he might have been infected with the Pandora virus. Another rather intriguing detail about Haven 43 and Sinedrion in general is their very limited ability to communicate or coordinate with other Havens. This is something that's been hinted at in some of the other fiction, but this is the first time it's actually been spelled out. According to Dr. Cole, they primarily rely on a laser communication system for one-on-one -on -one conversations and direct data transfers, but this isn't always possible. More notably, although unconfirmed, this is presumably how the Sinedrion AIs are capable of moving from Haven to Haven. Next we have Dr. Cole's brief meeting with Lieutenant Jonathan Rivers, which is actually packed with fascinating little details. First of all, Lieutenant Rivers accidentally refers to Sinedrion as Sindirion, which is a very deliberate Easter egg on the part of Dr. Stroud. It specifically refers to a somewhat infamous typo from the original crowdfunding campaign, one which was caught relatively quickly, but not before it caused significant confusion with, um, some of the people who were talking about the game. Somewhat less subtle was the direct reference to Project Vulture, which was first mentioned all the way back in briefing number three. This is New Jericho's somewhat ham-fisted attempt to understand how the Pandora virus works by capturing and studying human subjects that have been terminally infected with the Pandora virus. It's unusual that New Jericho would so carelessly reveal this project to Sinedrion, especially given the level of secrecy surrounding some of their other projects. Then again, briefing number three did heavily imply that Project Vulture was just a cover for some of New Jericho's other, less ethical projects, like Project Hecate. It's entirely possible that they deliberately revealed Project Vulture to Sinedrion, for some as-of-yet unrevealed reason. Of course, if it is a deliberate deception, then it's one that goes both ways. Throughout their interaction, Dr. Cole takes pains to maintain an aura of superiority, something which he refers to as promoting Sinedrion's mythology with outsiders. This appears to involve perpetuating the idea that Sinedrion is capable of scientific and technological miracles, including curing otherwise terminal Pandora virus infections. That, of course, brings us to the biggest takeaway from this story. Dr. Cole makes it clear that he holds New Jericho in contempt. He denigrates and lies to Lieutenant Rivers, refers to New Jericho as misguided, and even goes so far as to outright state that Sinedrion should take advantage of their ignorance. This takes a significant turn towards the sinister, when you realize that they are, in fact, taking full advantage of New Jericho, literally using them as lab rats in their biochemical research. As I mentioned earlier, Sinedrion didn't actually care about the petroleum that New Jericho had brought to trade with them. Rather, their primary reason for dealing with the more militant faction was to instead get them to unwittingly field test their genetically modified crops. Upon learning that the previous batch of modified crops had started to show signs of infection, Dr. Cole immediately requested copies of the relevant data using a tablet that had been specifically prepared for exactly that purpose. During the later forum, he specifically mentions that New Jericho will be field testing batch 416B. This matter-of-fact statement is almost farcical, given that Dr. Cole earlier criticized New Jericho for experimenting on live subjects. It even seems to give Sinedrion scientists pause, as there's a moment of awkward silence immediately after Dr. Cole announces that the trade has been completed. One last, rather intriguing detail about this segment is that Dr. Cole makes rather deliberate reference to organic printers. 
This is presumably how New Jericho will actually generate their newly modified crops, or at least the seeds they'll subsequently plant. This is rather interesting, implying at least some of the factions have access to technology capable of literally 3D printing living organic material. It's a minor point for now, but one that we'll be coming back to in just another moment. Next, we have the Forum, which, of course, largely revolves around Dr. Cole's ill-fated proposal. Before we get to that, though, it is worth noting that the scientists do briefly discuss the Disciples of Anu, again essentially presenting them as test subjects to observe. Although not quite as unethical as their interactions with New Jericho, they do make it clear that they're actively spying on Disciple Havens. This is something that might end up becoming relevant in the final game. As for Dr. Cole's Janus plan, that's something we've already pretty much covered. As I mentioned earlier, his plan is relatively straightforward, to essentially create a digital backup copy of humanity so that the species can be recreated at some point in the future. It's no wonder that his proposal was so thoroughly rejected, given that, even by his own admission, he hadn't really thought out the logistics or potential implications. Perhaps the only thing that is somewhat thought out is the idea of recreating human bodies for their digital minds to inhabit. Although far-fetched, this could be linked back to the organic printers that were so casually mentioned earlier in the story. If they're capable of creating actual living flora like corn and wheat, perhaps they could also eventually be used to create living bodies for digital minds, or perhaps even artificial intelligences, which could explain Adrestia's revised proposal. Another rather intriguing possibility, however, is that this might actually be how Synedrion will ultimately learn to coexist with the Pandora virus. They're already experimenting to find a way to create crops that can resist infection by the virus. What if they took this one step further, instead finding a way to create modified human bodies that are effectively immune to the Pandora virus? In theory, they could then use the same method of digital migration to transfer their minds into these new bodies without the need for a virtual habitat. Another rather interesting thought, however, is that the Janus plan might actually run parallel to exactly what the Pandora virus is trying to accomplish. Although we've speculated about the virus in the past, this particular story highlights a fascinating new theory. What if the virus is exactly the sort of thing that Dr. Cole is proposing? Now, obviously, this is pure speculation on my part, but the parallels do seem rather uncanny. What if the virus is some sort of organic wetware designed to preserve the memories of Yugoth's long-dead civilization? Is it possible that the virus was deliberately launched towards Earth with the intent of not only infecting or terraforming it, but also harvesting organic material to literally rebuild an entire species from scratch? Towards the end of the story, Dr. Cole even starts speculating about things like shared memories and cognitive links in specific relation to possible links between a human and their digital footprint. This actually seems to describe the virus itself, which does seem to actually maintain some sort of shared consciousness with anyone that it infects. Although it's a bit of a stretch, what if the dead god that seems to control the infected is actually the sort of virtual habitat that Dr. Cole proposed? Perhaps it was damaged when it impacted the moon or landed in the ocean, or perhaps even when it was poisoned by the precursor race. That could certainly explain its seemingly erratic and aggressive expansion once it reactivated in the 21st century. It might even explain the origin of entities like the Matriarch, the Exalted, or even the mysterious Kinling Woman featured in The Deaths No. 2. I've previously speculated that these might be members of the Precursor race, one that was tentatively identified as Homo habilis back in The Tomb of the Phoenix. However, this story opens up some new possibilities. What if they're actually scientists from a long-dead species, 
reborn before the Pandora virus essentially malfunctioned. Of course, that moves well beyond the scope of the current story, so let's just wrap things up for now. The final part of this story revolves around the discussion between Dr. Cole and Dr. Harris, followed by the sudden arrival of Adrestia. Although we're not given much to go on, it is made clear that something about Dr. Cole's proposal has caught Adrestia's attention. But the story concludes before we can actually find out what that is. One last rather intriguing detail, however, is how Dr. Cole describes Adresia's artificial appearance as an elongated and uncomfortable approximation of a human face. He specifically refers to it as resembling a Modigliani portrait, an artist well known for depicting people with elongated necks and faces. Perhaps it's sheer coincidence, but this is rather similar to the description of the precursor race from Tomb of the Phoenix. Given that Alan Stroud has essentially confirmed that Sinedrion has somehow obtained at least some of the Phoenix Project's records, could it be possible that Adrestia is deliberately emulating the appearance of the species described in Tomb of the Phoenix? Or, more likely, is this simply her way of distancing herself from humanity? After all, I previously speculated that the Barnabas AI may have been based on a human mind, but Adrestia is an entirely artificial intelligence. If we assume that Barnabas is essentially a digital footprint, akin to the sort that Dr. Cole wants to create, it could certainly explain Adrestia's sudden interest in the project especially given that she was apparently capable of seeing Barnabas's hidden core, the autonomous programming that Barnabas himself was unable to observe or interact with. The suicidal insanity that claimed Barnabas version 3.05 could very well be the sort of psychological complication that Dr. Cole predicted in his original proposal. As a truly artificial intelligence with intimate knowledge of an actual digitized human mind, Adrestia would be in a rather unique position to advise Dr. Cole on how to proceed. Of course, the real question would be exactly why she would want to do that, or what she might be trying to accomplish. But again, this is pure speculation on my part. Maybe I'm close, maybe I'm completely wrong. I suppose the real takeaway here is that imperfect physiology really just gives us more questions than answers. But hey, at least it gives us something to talk about. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. We'll pick up here next time as we finally delve into briefing number 6, which explores the origin of the Phoenix Project itself. For now though, this is Redcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Phoenix Point, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, the official Discord channel, the official YouTube channel, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on FIG. As always, links are in the description.